I, I have a, a very important ritual, weekly ritual in my life. On a Sunday, I always buy the Observer, I always take the review section, and I turn the pages to find John Norton's column. I've read it avidly for many years. Because I think not only is it amusing, it's also wise. Uh, and I think we see eye to eye. It's marvelous to have him here uh, to talk to us about his view of history of computing, together with Bill Thompson, another Cambridge man, who I don't know so well. I don't look at your blog on the website uh, as I should do. So, John, I'm speaking first. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. As you've already gathered, perhaps um, uh, he's to blame for all of this. It was his idea. Um, it's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, neither Bill nor I are terribly scholarly people, as you are. Um, and so we figured after a while that perhaps our role was to be the kind of comic relief in the annual program. Uh, and we're happy to play that role. Um, we've, we've got um, we've, we've got a running order. We're going to do a, a double act. Um, but before we start, Bill has a prologue. Um, it's really because we're here to talk about the things we think we know and things we don't really know. And uh, one of the things we think we know about is the history of this device, the transistor, uh, the basis of the uh, electronics age in which we currently live. Um, and there is a, a generally understood story. And the story is, is expressed by Britannia, as found on many websites, of course, tells us that Don Bardeen, Walter Britton, and William Shockley invented the transistor in 1947. And indeed, if we go to the AT&T website, the corporate website, a corporate history, it has a photograph of the three of them looking very, very keen and enthusiastic in front of some sort of flashing lantern designed to um, impress the novice. Um, not only did they invent the transistor, but they got one of these for doing it, which is, of course, the, the sort of a great sign that it was their work. But some of you may know that, of course, it wasn't their work, that the work they did on the transistor was building on work that had been done by other people throughout the years, and in particular, the work of Julius Lillianfield, who, in 1925, before an idea, a Canadian inventor, who actually patented in Canada some of his ideas, who is not known to have built a working model, but his work was definitely known to Shockley and the others because papers released by Bell Labs demonstrate that they were aware of it and had built prototypes around his ideas. But what's happened is that the driving narrative, the story of the corporate lab making the great insight, making the great breakthrough, has become the story that we all think we know. And if we go to Google Books, an interesting index, and search for Lillianfeld transistor, then what we find is, first, they don't know how to spell his name. <laughs> and secondly, we find about 119 results. And if we look for Shockley, they do know how to spell his name, and we find 38,800 results in the books. So there is clearly a story here that is the story that people think they know. Now, it's interesting that since over the last few years, sites like Wikipedia do reflect the true history much more, and that story is starting to be challenged. But in the textbooks that children are reading, in the books that are being indexed by Google Books, that's not the story that's known. And what John and I want to do today is to ask some questions about other well-known stories and ask about why this process happens. So I'll pass it over to John for the first introduction. Thank you. Do you mind if I shut your machine? Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to go through some stories about the history of computing. Um, where there is uh, an established version or a received version, um, which is what you'd find if you Google things normally, um, and what you'd find if you ask somebody in the club who knew about these things. Um, we have a number of case studies. Uh, some of them will be very familiar to you, others um, perhaps not, but let's have a go. I'll start with something very dear to my heart, which is um, the history of the internet and in particular the origins of packet switching. 
Now, the received version goes something like this. In 1960, Yeah, I don't have any pictures, I only talk. <laughs> that, that's a Microsoft picture, it's the blue screen of hell. <laughs> they, they only have one of these, so they use it everywhere in their corporate presentations. <laughs> um, you, you do know the joke about, about the NASA uh, mission that goes out into the furthest reaches of space, uh, and after 20 years or whatever it is, it finally sends back its first signal start to arrive back, and there's great jubilation in NASA headquarters. Until a techie says, now comes the hard bit, we have to reinstall Windows 95. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, now the story about packet switching, uh, the received version is well known, and it is in 1960, uh, an interesting man called Paul Baran goes to work for the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica. And uh, Rand is a very interesting organization, as you know, and it operates in a very liberal and, and quite uh, uh, enlightened way. Uh, in the sense that the Defence Department gave it quite a lot of money every year and said that these are the things we're interested in. And then the, the round management passed it round, passed, it, passed this list round and said, anybody here interested in working on this? And Paul Brown was interested in working on a problem which was the design of a resilient network. Um, and he, he went to work on, on, this, um, on this project and he came up pretty quickly with um, a lovely idea which was for a distributed mesh-like digital uh, packet switching design. Um, and that design was complete by 1962. And he published it openly, or ran published it openly in 1964. And it was for a network of 1,024 switching nodes which sent and received message blocks via low power microwave transmitters mounted on small towers. And of course, it, it envisaged from the beginning that everything that passed around this uh, network would be digitized, encrypted voice, and data. Perfectly simple. Okay. In 1964, um, Leo Kleinrock uh, at UCLA publishes uh, his, his book about message switching, um, which is published by Wiley. In 1968, uh, ARPA, the, the Advanced Research Project Agency in the Pentagon, um, calls for, uh, sent out a call for proposals for, to build um, a, a network on specified as to how it would work. Um, this was the, the venture that was funded initially by Bob Taylor. Um, in, Late 1968, I think it is, um, Bolt, Brannock and Newman, a consulting firm in, 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 uh, in Boston, gets the, the contract. Um, and because they're in Senator Edward Kennedy's constituency, um, when this is, this is announced, they, uh, they, they, um, they, they talk about how they get to build a network with um, interface message processing IMPs and so on. And they got a congratulatory message from Ted Kennedy um, um, saying, well done on getting the interface message processing system contract. Um, but anyway, ARPA calls for network proposal and, and, and BBN get the contract. Um, and in 1969, the first node um, is, is, is set up in, in, in Clarence Rab in UCLA. And between 1969 and 72, the ARPANET is constructed. OK, so the established version, basically, is that um, this is a great American story. Now, the, the, the point of this is that history is always written backwards uh, with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and the point about that is that uh, it actually then, therefore, inevitably presents a misleading picture of what happened. Um, and it gives rise to, in a sense, to this feeling when you read the history of anything of it's a story of inevitable progress because it's written from what we know now. Um, uh, Harry Butterfield, the great came to story, um, thought about this in relation to the writing of history in general, and he, he described this phenomenon as the Whig interpretation of history, in other words, they're looking back from the point of view of the present and interpreting the past as a constant kind of progress towards, towards the present, which is better than the moment before. And the problem with that is that it ignores something really critical, which is that in real life, um, at any point in history, the future is unknown. And that's what the Whig interpretation ignores, because what happens is that it only picks up on what happened, what built on, what, what became successful, what went on later. And at that point, um, it becomes misleading. That's not, it's not deliberately misleading, it's inevitably misleading. Um, and our question was, and that's why I started with the, with the, with the, ARP, with the ARPANET story, um, what would the history of, and the history of computing, in my opinion, is written like that too. So what would the history of computing look like 
if we questioned that Greek interpretation. Um, and so what we, what we decided to do is to pick some stories, as Bill said, which, which we think we know, and then go and examine them. Now, in the case of, of the packet switching, the, 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 the established story, the Whig interpretation, as you were, is, is, is this story I've just related to you. Um, and it's fine, and it's a very intrinsic picture, and it's very comforting to, to lots of people in the United States and the rest of it. Okay, now there's an alternative version. Um, and the alternative version says, uh, well, it, between 1964 and 1967, after Paul Rand, who had come up with this idea, and, uh, up, and had been published by Rand and so on, he spent three years trying to persuade analog engineers at AT&T that this network was viable. And they didn't believe him, basically. Nobody in AT&T believed him. And secondly, once they got a glimmer of what it was about, they thought, hey, this could be, a, this could be an alternative telephone system. And at that point, they said, we're bloody well not going to allow it. Okay, so Barron got nowhere. His, there's, there's one of the set of interviews with him uh, on his discussion that he got nowhere with at and absolutely nowhere. Okay, but nevertheless, um, some people liked the idea, including people in the Defence Department. And um, Rand made a proposal in 1965 to the United States Air Force that an experimental version of Rand's network should be built, and the Air Force enthusiastically agreed. The problem was the fly in the ointment was that. Um, between the time that, in fact, from the moment that, that, that Barron had started work, John Kennedy had become president. And Kennedy had installed in the Pentagon Robert McNamara, a guy whose only previous experience in doing anything was running the Ford Motor Company. Um, and McNamara was an efficiency freak um, with, with very carefully grilled cream hair and a frighteningly intense look. Um, and he decided that basically uh, that, that some things ought to be outsourced. It's a bit like the present government looking for efficiency savings. And one of the things he decided that all the communication stuff handled within the Department of Defense ought to be handled by a separate agency called the Defense Communications Agency. And when they were setting up the Defense Communications Agency, you guess, <laughs> guess who they employed? Lots of it, guys from AT&T. And Barron then realized that if the Air Force decision to set up an experimental version of his network was to be done, it was going to be done by these cretins. And at that point, he said, if they do it, they'll screw it up. They'll make sure it doesn't work, and the idea will be dead forever. And rather than have his baby strangled like that, he actually withdrew the proposal. And his work disappeared. Okay? Now, um, in 1968, the work starts on the, on the ARPANET project under Larry Roberts. <coughs> Roberts is very bright, but at that point, nobody actually seems to have any idea of what kind of technology would actually work, the, the network would be built on. Um, Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, um, in November 1965, there's a wonderful man called Don Davies, working at the National Physical Laboratory. Some of you would, would have known him, as I did. And he organized a three-day seminar on time sharing <coughs> on the problem of facilitating communication between computers. And he becomes really interested in the problem. He comes up independently with the idea of data packets and packet switching. He, he doesn't know anything about Barron's work, even though he had once visited Rand. Nobody told him about it. Um, in 1966, he gives a public lecture on the future digital communication network in which he outlines the ideas about packet switching. After the lecture, a sinister figure from the Ministry of Defence comes up to him and says, Dear boy, do you, have you ever heard of this chap, Barron? And he had. Um, in 1966, Davies wrote a 25 page proposal for a digital communication network within NPL. Um, in August 1966, he was promoted to director of um, the computing division. And then he had enough authority to go ahead. And with a small team led by Roger Scantlebury, they started building a packet switching network. In August 1967, that network uh, was up and running. So they had a packet switch network running within NPL. Um, and they wrote a paper for the ACM Symposium on Operating Systems, which is to be held at Gatlinburg in October 67. In October 67, Roger Scantlebury presents the paper at the symposium. Larry Roberts and his ARPANET team are there. And I believe this is the first time they've learned about Paul Barron's work. That's the first time they knew about it, because when they went back to their offices in the Pentagon, they discovered that somewhere in the files, there were all around reports. Okay. Now, the point I'm trying to make about that is that this is a completely different version. And I was hoping that Roger would be here today so he could have filled it up. But, but essentially, my hypothesis is that, in fact, when, when Larry Roberts and Co. were embarking on the building of the ARPANET, they had ideas about 
roughly what it should do and what sort of communication lines it should have. But they didn't actually know what sort of packets were changed, what, what sort of technology it should use. And they didn't know about Paul Barron's work. And if that strange accident of history hadn't happened, if Don Davies hadn't come on it, if, if Roger Scanderbury hadn't gone to Captain Burton and the rest of it, it would have happened differently. And that's the whole point of, of looking at history from this point of view. Suddenly there's a different angle on it. So that's the start, that's the first case study. I'm going to ask Bill now just to pick up another one. I might even have some pictures to show you. But I might not, depending on whether this flashes back to my. Um, I, in the 1990s, um, worked for a company called Pipex in Cambridge. Some of you may have heard of it, may recall it, some of you may have encountered Peter Dorr. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's unchanged. Um, and it was a very interesting time because I had been working at the instruction set which is a computer training company where we used to do fantastic things um, and um, I had a wonderful time. And I got to Pipex to head up their training division and rapidly became the internet ambassador <laughs> because at the time Pipex was selling 64k leased lines uh, for only a thousand pounds a month, bargain, get, get your bandwidth here. And it was finding it very easy to sell them but less easy to renew after 12 months because companies had discovered that just being able to exchange emails, use FTP and um, have access to Usenet wasn't necessarily enough to justify the expenditure. Unfortunately, in late 93, 94, the web came along and provided a reason, provided something which anybody could see was going to make the use of an internet connected computer interesting. Um, and as a result, I kept went from strength to strength. And my role was, um, my job description was to do cool stuff. So I built a website for Comic Relief, um, I built a website for the Cambridge Folk Festival and for the Edinburgh Fringe and for Anne Campbell, who was a local MP, and I did some work with The Guardian as well and built The Guardian, did the first Guardian online presence, and was eventually sort of asked to go and work at The Guardian and I built their first website. Uh, it used to run on a server on my desk, I had the screwdriver, I ran with the DNS as well as being the managing editor, because that's how vertically integrated those were in those days. And, and it was indeed a fine time. That was around the time, of course, that the major computer companies were just starting to engage with the internet as a phenomenon uh, and with the web itself. And in particular, it was the days in which publishing on the web was somewhat controversial because there were other publishing platforms available, AOL, CompuServe. And in particular, Microsoft, with Microsoft Network, which came out with Windows 95, and their Bluebird publishing system, which some of you may recall, which they persuaded many content providers to invest large amounts of time and energy in, and then canned overnight when Bill Gates had his internet revelation. And there's a story about how that revelation played itself out that's encapsulated in the phrase, the browser wars that people who used Windows 95 had versions of Internet Explorer available to them. I 1, 2, and 3, which were just applications that, that ran on top of Windows and like any other application, and indeed were largely based on code licensed from Spyglass, and of course IE4, which was launched in 1997, and came up against Netscape Navigator. Netscape can be founded by Mark Andreessen, one of the team who'd written the original NCSA mosaic back in 93, a different code base. And interesting enough, I use 1, 2, and 3 were running on something much more like the old NCSA mosaic code base because they'd licensed the Bible. So there's a story there that, in fact, Microsoft was challenging this with code that had been previously written by the same man. And Internet Explorer 4 has had a, should we say, a bad press. IE4 is seen to have been a devious piece of software because it was so closely integrated with the operating system. And if you look still on the BBC website, screenshots taken this morning, there are stories about how Microsoft suffered at the hands of the US Attorney General, at the hands of the Justice Department under Bill Clinton, later at the hands of the European Commission, being forced to pay reparation, being forced to change the install process. And the tale that's told is that Netscape, in particular, was taken down 
by the business practices of Microsoft, who used their market influence, who ensured that every copy of Windows shipped with their browser, initially IE4 and then afterwards, who integrated the browser so closely into the core operating system functionality that even if you remove the browser, it still relied on all the rendering code in order to display many different file types. So whereas you could install alternative browsers like Netscape, like the early implementations of Opera, like the ones that existed at the time, you're always going to be forced back onto Internet Explorer. And that was the thing which fatally damaged Netscape, which led to its eventual purchase by AOL, its collapse, the emergence of the Mozilla Foundation, and then the triumphant emergence of Firefox, which has just recently become one of those bloated pieces of software that has been like pity to run on my computer, and I've started moving over to Chrome because things move on. And that's the story I believed too. I believed it so much that in an article written on the 15th anniversary of the release of Windows 95, I wrote this piece for the BBC website. As you can see, the launch might start the browser wars, i4 is closely integrated, very hard to copy to browsers. And within a matter of minutes, I got one of the angriest emails I ever got from anybody, um, saying this, that the thing was, the i4 is actually a much better piece of code. But the thing that is missed and ignored is that Microsoft software engineers have done the most devious anti-competitive thing you can do, which is actually write good code and then ship it. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> because that's not what the computing industry expects, and it's not what it wants, and it's going to happen. And indeed, if you look at the support for what eventually became DHTR, at the support for CSS, at the way in which ID4 was written for its target market of corporate users, as well as the home market and home product market, this does seem to have a lot behind it. That whilst Microsoft may then have taken the advantage that that gave them, and did do the things of which they are accused in terms of the market and their market share, they would not have succeeded had people particularly within businesses not being able to write to IE4 and know that pages would render as required, had they not been able to roll out security patches as required, had they not been able to integrate it into their corporate environments. And so the browser wars didn't happen in the way we think they did, and in particular, that we should reserve our criticisms perhaps for one aspect of Microsoft's behavior and not just say they shipped a whole load of shoddy code and then forced it on us. Because people chose it, developers found it useful. And that's a very different perspective, one that could have gone in different ways, because it may well have been that had Microsoft chosen just to rely on the software and not felt threatened in the way they apparently did, <coughs> they'd be in a dominant position now in the current internet world, because they wouldn't have to waste so much time and energy, particularly at a senior level, fighting back against the, the uh, regulators who were ranged against them. I want to pick up with another Microsoft story. Um, this is, the received version of this is a great comic tale. And it's basically about how a number of people made fools of themselves and how Bill Gates went with everybody. But, but the raw bones of this, um, in, in, in the late, very late 1970s and 19, early 1980s, the IBM uh, board decided, after a number of futile efforts in making small computers, decided that they would need to have um, a personal computer. And in the end, the way they did it, when the brother was most on IBM-like, they put together a team of renegades, they isolated them in Baton, in Baton, I can't remember, it's a place in Florida anyway, um, and said, you, you ship it in a year, Baton Rouge, is it Baton Rouge? No, um, no Boca Raton. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, but the basic the thing was ship this thing in a year, and we don't care how you do it. And so, faced with that, this team um, decided that they would they would build something which had an open architecture, where IBM would not make any of it, just build it in and put it together using the model established by the Apple II. Um, okay, so that's that's the context of it. Now, they need um, an operating system for it. Um, and initially they go to Microsoft, and Microsoft doesn't have an operating system. Uh, Microsoft's a language company at that point, it does languages. Um, 
So the story is how Microsoft, which didn't have an operating system, wound up having an operating system, sending it to, the, to, to IBM, and then in the end became a company which grew to monopolistic powers as a result of its monopoly of the uh, of its control of the operating system market. That's that's the established method. Um, other bits of this story, or the comic relief bits of it, are that the the guy who wrote the first operating system for eight bit um, for the eighty eighty chip, Gary Kildall, who wrote CPM, um, could have had this operating system market to himself and blew it. Um, that the, a little company around the corner from from Mogra Microsoft then was in Seattle. Uh, actually wrote the operating system that IBM wound up using um, and the fools sold it to Gates for 50,000 um, bucks and were therefore screwed as well. And the last bit of the, the comic relief bit of the story is that IBM, after all of that, didn't spot that they should have held on to the operating system. They didn't. They insisted that Microsoft should own it and Microsoft wound up taking them to the cleaners and to everywhere else. Okay. That's the that's the, that's, the, that's the story, and it's a great story, and it's told many times in entertaining ways by people like um, uh, Robert Cringely um, uh, and others. It's a, it's a very, very good story. Um, there is an alternative version, and when you start to probe into it, uh, it gets more and more interesting, because you, you then begin to see the, the effects of the Whig interpretation, and you also see um, what it's like when you look at it differently, when you look at it from the point of view of Try to put yourself in, in the position of individuals in this story at a particular point in time and see how their actions look in that light rather than in the light of um, the 2020 vision of hindsight. So we take three things, Gary Kildall. Um, Kildall was an interesting guy who wrote, who wrote CPM. Some of you will remember CPM. I remember it fondly. Um, he was a very clever and interesting guy, but he wasn't primarily motivated by money. He, to his astonishment, he found that he made lots of money out of CPM. It just flowed in. Um, one of his, one of his um, uh, employees, Gordon Eubanks, once said, Gary didn't give a shit about the business. He was more interested in getting laid. <laughs> so much went for so well for so long that he couldn't imagine it would change. When it did, when change was forced upon him, Gary didn't know how to handle it. That's in Bob Prince's book. But the, the essentially, this, the, what, what happened was that um, uh, the IBM crowd eventually started to say, we, got, we need an operating system, and they went to Microsoft. And Microsoft didn't have an operating system. And strangely enough, Bill Gates said, we don't have one. But I know a guy who does, because he knew that Gary Kildall, whom he was, with whom he was intimately friendly, was working kind of sporadically on an operating, a 16-bit version of CPM for the 8086 uh, chip. And in fact, he made a phone call to Kildall and said, I've got these guys here, and um, I'm going to send them down to you. And, the next, and that night, the, the three guys from IBM in suits and the ties and the rest of it, took the plane down and they went to see Kildall. And when they arrived, um, they found that Kildall was out flying his plane, because he liked doing that, and his wife was in charge. And um, she said, uh, well, I'm afraid he's out. Um, and, um, and they said, who are you? And they said, we're, we're from IBM. And she said, what's it about? And they produced 30 pages of prime legal verbiage, the IBM non-disclosure agreement that said, sign here. And she looked at it, and she saw. She read through the first three pages, and basically said, "I'm not signing that." And they said, "Well, we can't talk to you then." So the, the discussion goes on. Anyway, but, but the, the discussion kept not got nowhere, essentially. Um, and in the end, what happened is that the IBM crowd went back uh, to to Bill Gates and said, "Look, this is where we are." At that point, Gates still didn't have an operating system, but he knew about a, a small company around the corner called Seattle Computer, which had been building eight or 8086 boards and didn't, were waiting for Kildo to produce the 16 bit CPM and he wasn't producing it. So in the end, the guy called Tim Patterson, working for Seattle Computer, wrote the first, he wrote, wrote an operating system which he called QDOS, Quick and Dirty Operating System. Um, <laughs> and basically, Gates thought, well, this is a way. So he went on the corner and he bought it. Initially, he licensed it and then later on, he offered them £50,000 for the exclusive to buy it and they, 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 um, they signed on the dotted line. Um, so, you have this story that in Gary Kildall's case, um, Kildall wasn't that interested in making money, and um, if you were in his position and you were faced with three guys from IBM and a 30-page non-disclosure agreement, which was very unfair, I mean, it gave all the rights to IBM and none to you, you'd have said, stuff it, go to hell. It was quite a reasonable thing to do. He was making $4 million a year from CPM, you know, he had a plane, so on. Um, 
Now, what about the poor guys in Seattle Computer, who are the kind of four guys of part of the story in, in the in the week, in the week version? Well, um, as I said, they they wrote QDOS because um, because they were wanted something to be able to run on the 86 boards they were making, and CPM was, uh, Killer wasn't coming up with it, so they, so they wrote it. Um, when they were offered the original deal from Microsoft, they, looked, they were a very small company, and they were offered. Um, uh, £25,000 per licensee, uh, $25,000 per licensee, plus some kind of small royalty payment, and they thought they were a very small company, this is better money than we've ever had before, so it seemed reasonable to sign up to that. They didn't know that there was only going to be one licensee at IBM, because at that point IBM's involvement this was a secret. Um, and it, came, it gave them preferential rights to Microsoft languages and two other things. So if you were standing there in their shoes at that time, it might have seemed like a good idea. In retrospect, it looks completely daft. They gave away one of the biggest gold mines in the history of the world. And that's what the quick interpretation says, but actually... Now, IBM, just to finish with that, not that I feel sorry for them, but nevertheless, they come out badly from the story. They come out a bit like um, Xerox comes out of the story for a Xerox Park, which is they fumble the future. In the sense. And in particular, they fumble the future because, according to the quick interpretation, they really ought to have kept the rights to the ms -DOS. They, they commissioned Microsoft to produce an operating system, and they ought to have taken that as the, the rights of the of the, that Microsoft should be treated as a contractor, and IBM should have had the rights. Okay, uh, and and weren't they stupid not to see it? Right. Okay. Well, project yourself back into IBM's shoes at the time. IBM was threatened with a really serious antitrust lawsuit by the U.S. government, and they were terrified of doing things that might actually expose them to more risk on the antitrust front. So their view was: we're going to build this machine. We're going to brand it with our with our name. But actually, everybody else involved with this is going to carry the can for it. We're going to, we're going to be hands off. Okay. So, from the IBM uh, corporate point of view, it probably made perfect sense not to take the rights of the thing. And yet, when we look at it for the benefit of hindsight, we say, how could they be so stupid? <laughs> but that's the way the big interpretation sort of um, screws it. No. It's also worth pointing out that IBM, as some John and I were discussing this, may well have believed that leaving with Microsoft wouldn't make any difference anyway, because Microsoft would be unable to do anything useful with it, because nobody would ever want to buy a non-IBM badged personal computer because it was not IBM badged. I mean, who'd be so foolish? Um, and again, there are there are good rational reasons for people to make decisions that we can, if we if we try to compose the golden narrative seemed foolish at the time. The Beatles were actually not a very good band. Mm -hmm. That's the point. They got better, but the people who were being asked to sign them were being asked to make a bet on four rather scruffy boys. Um, and I doubt many of us would have signed them based on the music they were producing at the time or believed it would have done the things they wanted. So we shouldn't be too hard on people who make those choices. Um, now, which one was I coming on to? Oh, that's right. Um, we shouldn't be too hard on um, Larry, Larry Page and Sergey Brin either, and two of the nicest people um, you could ever hope to meet. Actually, I, I interviewed Sergey once in around 2000, so before the unstoppable rise, and he was a really charming but slightly shy, self-effacing mathematician um, who seemed to be sort of a little bit surprised that his theories seemed to be on the verge of making him some money, um, and not really quite sure what to do with it all. Um, it seems like he's become much harder, harsher since then. I'm not sure his fundamental personality has, has changed. I was uh, having a conversation um, with someone about the BBC's archive, the BBC's audio visual, uh, visual archive, because I'm involved in it at the moment in attempts to make it more widely available. And somebody remarked as an aside, didn't Larry or Sergey offer to buy that? You know, just with their personal checkbook, as it were, not as a Google project. Um, and they may have well done, but clearly the uh, offer was refused, which we should be grateful. But there is a story of Google, uh, original logo, that, that again positions the inexorable rise of the company. That if you look back from where they are now, with their astonishingly dominant position in the search market, where they're astonishingly effective business model, with their approach to, to their employees who can invest their 20% time in all sorts of interesting projects, with their ability to shrug off disasters that would sink other companies, like Wave, for example, the launch of 
um, their other being. Adult being, um, I can't remember their social network. Orchid. Bu- buzz. No, Buzz. buzz okay. Orchid's doing quite well in Brazil and India. Uh, we just don't, don't notice it. Um, but there is a story of Google that has the rise of symmetry. And if we look at the history from 95, when, when Brilliant Page met at Stanford, and the launch in 97 of Backrub, their, their, their service, through to the investment from Andy Betts for Science, that's the one, um, in 1998, they got $100,000, and then in June 1999, $25 million from Sequoia Capital. When in 2000, they were able to act as the main search provider for Yahoo. It does look like they've just continued to grow. But if we look closer into the history, the Google business model, the model that they sold to their VCs, they sold to their backers, they believed it would make them rich, failed that their intention was to be a white label search engine for others. They wanted to power the search for the BBC. They did power the search for Virgin Net when it launched. They powered the search for Yahoo. The Google homepage was there as a shop window. And the intention was that they would make money by licensing their superior technology to others, or that they would sell out at an appropriate point for quite a large amount of money, perhaps even in the hundreds of millions and Apple's then looking for the hundreds of billions. And they were very, very close to collapse when they were saved by taking someone else's business model and tweaking it slightly and making it work for them. So they had built a better search engine. And nobody should dispute that. The, the, the way Google approached search back in the early years of this um, century was far superior to what Altavista and others were doing. It offered better and more, more relevant results for people. But they didn't know how to make money out of it, and others, the businesses they were trying to sell to, weren't convinced of what they were doing. And Google could very easily have become just a footnote, or a technology that was bought up by someone and then either ruined, as so many technologies are, by a large corporate owner, we can think of many examples of that, or just integrated in a way which supported another search engine. But what changed was that they saw the work that was being done uh, by Bill, by, on this side, sorry, I'm getting really lost in my notes, and I've got far too many pieces of paper here, by a guy called Bill Gross. And Bill Gross ran something called the Idea Lab, which was an incubator. It was a very fine incubator. And he had come up with goto.com as a way of selling advertising he was the person who realized that you could take a keyword that someone entered in a search engine and use that to target advertising for them and make that advertising far more relevant. And that doing that allowed you to charge more money for it. And he was the person who took the risk of offering his advertisers pay per click, pay by results for the first time. Up until that point, advertising was Paid for thousands. You paid by impression, and whether the advert was clicked on or not was irrelevant. And Bill Gross in GoTo.com, which then later became Overture and was then later sold to Yahoo, was the person who realized that you could do it differently. And the team at Google, desperate for something to save the money, to save the business as it was starting to run out of cash, took this idea and incorporated it in what they're doing. Now, there was already advertising on Google. AdWords was launched in 2000. But when AdWords launched, it was just a fairly traditional advertising package. They had 350 customers who were paying per thousand impressions. And Google took the paper click ad. In fact, they tried to license the technology from GoTo, failed to do that, and so just implemented something themselves. But they did do one thing too. They added the wrinkle which is that in the auctions that take place, that took place on GoTo, the highest bidder won. So if you bid for a keyword, like automobiles or whatever, and you bid more than everyone else, even if your advert was never clicked on, you would still win the bid. What Google did was to add relevance to the auction process, and to actually incorporate in the auction bid itself a measure of how effective the advert was at generating click-throughs. So if your advert generated a lot of click-throughs, you could get it at a lower price 
and someone whose advert was less effective, even though they were willing to pay more. And that, taken overall, made a lot more money for Google and made the adverts more interesting and relevant and less intrusive to people. So Google didn't make their money out of search, and they nearly didn't make a business out of search at all, even though it's the backward-facing story is that their search came to dominate because it was so good. They succeeded because at a critical point, they made a right decision and added a wrinkle to it. And that tends to get obscured as we look at its size and scale now. Mention of Google um, brings me to um, another story. Um, this one is about cloud computing, which at the moment is, is what um, um, people in the media regard as the, the big computing story. Um, and again, there's a received version. The received version says, in the 1960s, John McCarthy, wonderful computer scientist, artificial intelligence pioneer, and the father of Lisp, uh, said somewhere once, and somebody wrote it down, computation may someday be organized as a public utility. Um, nobody paid much attention to that at the time. In 1982, um, John Gage joined the new, a new company called Sun Microsystems. He was his 21st employee. And some time after he joined, he uttered the phrase, the network is the computer. And Scott McMillian and Cole took that and thought that's our motto. So it became the motto for some microsystems of lots for quite a long time. Um, and then nothing happens for a long time uh, until the, the mid-2000s mid when Amazon launches the Amazon Web Service, first of all, and then slightly after that, the Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud. Uh, and bingo, here we have cloud computing. That's the kind of received story at the moment. It's a seamless transition from John McCarthy's insight right through to what Werner Vogels and his, his mates and Amazon have done with this amazing kind of cloud computing facility they've got. Um, now, the alternative version actually is different. Um, and it runs like this. Um, from a period from 1978 until 1994, it was true that the PC was the computer. Okay. Um, those of us who, who went from being um, the, 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 the pathetic serfs who used university time sharing machines managed by people like David Hartley, suddenly so, <laughs> so we went, we were liberated from, from his tyrannical control and we had our own PCs and our own disks and all this, but it was just wonderful. Okay. Well, that, that started with the Apple II. It, of course, uh, built up with the, with the IBM PC in the 1980s. Um, and then in 1993, the web goes mainstream web with the release of the Mosaic browser. Um, uh, so from 1978 until 1994, it was indeed true that the computer was the computer, that the PC was the computer. Okay. But something, some interesting things, really important things happened in 1994, which are not normally reckoned with at all in the, in the Wig interpretation of the story. The first thing is that as you will remember, in those days, before 1994, if you wanted to use email, and most of us did, because it was a one time a killer app for the web, even though no, no, no person under 20 now uses it. Um, but but email, you, had, you, email, you ran an email client on your computer, and it handled your email, and it sent it out using SMTP and the pop protocols and all the rest of it, and that's the way you did email. Um, and then Netscape um, floated in uh, 90, Netscape was founded in 94. Um, and floated in August 95, triggering off the first internet boom. But before Net Netscape launched, there was an awful lot of, there was a, a rising level of hysteria in Silicon Valley, because it was clear that Netscape was a really big, going to be the next big thing, um, and something was happening. And there, there was a hiring, suddenly there was, it was desperately important to get good software people. And um, and, and you had this competitive bidding process starting in the valley for really good software people. And one of the problems was, as you, as you can imagine, that if you're working for X company in the, in, the, in the old days, you were using their email client running on their network PC on their network. And they took a very poor view of you using that, those services in order to send your resume or your CV to your competitor down the road. But it was quite clear that if you get your CV out some way quickly, you might get a job much better than when you have just now. And I think Sabir Bhatia was one of an Indian software engineer, um, looked at this problem because he experienced it himself, and he thought there has to be a better way of doing it. And he came up with the idea of Hotmail. You know, um, uh, 
doing your doing the email exclusively through the browser and doing it on a, holding all the stuff on the server somewhere else in the cloud and the rest of it. And um, so, although people didn't realise it at the time, 1994 when Hotmail launched was an absolutely critical threshold because once Hotmail started, a lot of people who were not techies, not computer people. Uh, they thought, well, actually, this is a much better way of doing email because I can get my email from anywhere and I don't have to have, if I can have it somewhere with a browser and internet connection, I get my email. And so you had Hotmail that year. And of course, the next thing that happens late that year and the early next year is DEC, the Dig Digital Equipment Corporation of Blessed Memory, had developed a very interesting processor, the Alpha processor, and it was desperately seeking some way of showing off how good it was. And the people in their research, a Western um, research laboratory, thought, well, we could do it with a search engine, which had a, both a prover and, and an indexer. Uh, and they came up with this idea, and they launched it as Alta Vista. And Alta Vista, as many of you remember, was the first decent search engine. And it became rapidly very dominant very quickly. Um, but the point about Alta, Alta Vista is that everything happened through the browser out there somewhere else. It was a wreck of Alpha servers, to, uh, Alpha uh, machines running, running somewhere else. Um, and then um, in 1998, uh, Google launches in 1999. Blogger.com launches um, in 2003. WordPress launches in 2004. Flickr launches in 2005. Google Docs are launched uh, in 2005. Zoho Office Suite launches, um, and so you find that basically um, that the world of cloud computing kind of arrived. Now the interesting thing about it is, first of all, that this, the, the the thing that propelled the ordinary user over the threshold into this different world was nothing to do with John McCarthy and everybody else. It was simply to do with webmail and later with search. Um, and the strange thing about it also is that um, it was ordinary use as well as the corporates that got there first. So people have been in the cloud computing world since 1994, even though they may not have known it. But you'd never gather that from the Greek interpretation. Bill. That's what it is, thank you. Okay. The last one is about, is a, it's a contemporary one, which is still going on. And it's a story of what happened to the music industry. Okay? Because once upon a time there was a music industry that involved record companies. Remember record companies? Very powerful, interesting, important, profitable objects and the rest of it. Okay, here's the received version. In 1982, music goes digital, because that's the year in which CD players first came on, on the market in Britain. Um, CD provides a way of transporting bit streams from recording studio to home, because it was the only way of getting those bit streams from the studio to the home in those days. You had to make the plastic discs, you had to stamp a label on them, you had to burn the stuff onto them, then you had to put them into, trans into uh, boxes that broke. And then you put the boxes that broke into a case and you put them into uh, a bigger box and then they went into a, a, a truck and they were taken to a warehouse and then they were taken from the warehouse to the retailer and the boxes that were unpacked and then the discs were taken out of the box, which was was broken as well. Um, and the consumer bought it, came in, bought the disc, which was then put back in the broken box, given to the consumer, and the consumer went home and put it into his player, and the player took the bits and translated them into sound. Okay. That was the way the music industry, in 1982-3, that was the way it got bits from one place to the next. What it didn't notice was that in July 1983, the internet was switched on. And the internet is a global machine designed to transport bits from one place to the other. But the music industry chose to ignore that or didn't know it. Okay, so from 1983 onwards, from the time the internet, the TCP IP net network started in public, um, there was actually a lot of music uh, on the network in, in servers here and there. But of course, in general, music files are very large because they were uncompressed. Um, in 1991, MP3 compression arrives and becomes an ISO standard in 1993. 1991, the MP3 arrives, becomes a standard in 93. In 1994, the first MP3 encoder is released. In 1997, a Czech, Czech or Croatian programmer launches AMP, which is an MP3 ripper, takes the disk and compresses the, the, the tracks uh, for Unix. And the next year, Winamp for Windows did the same. Uh, and suddenly it was possible to store large music collections on hard drives. The problem is it was very hard still to get them and to share them. In 1999, they disaffected a teenager called Sean Fanning, uh, writes and releases Napster as a client on a, on a server, uh, and he releases on the net, doesn't tell anybody, um, doesn't ask anybody's permission, and within uh, 18 months he has 60 million users who are freely 
he creates what somebody called the intergalactic jukebox. Everything that was ever recorded was actually on the net in that heyday of Napster, and you could get it for free. Uh, the, the music industry doesn't like this. The music industry sues like hell. Napster gets shut down in 2001. But by that stage, the genius out of pop peer to peer networking is up and running in a big way. Still is. Um, the file sharing continues to boom. The record industry takes a powder. Um, never recovered from it. Um, in 2001, Apple launches iTunes and iPod. Um, and now Apple owns the music business. So that's the received version. Uh, it was destroyed by clever software. Um, from beginning to end. But. Well, stay there. Exactly, it wasn't really the software that destroyed it. In fact, what destroyed it was probably a single technical decision uh, made by the people who make these, which is not to put encryption onto the original CD standard uh, in the rainbow books. And that lack of any bit to enforce encryption meant that the CDs could easily be ripped. And then the decision by manufacturers, Toshiba, HP, everyone else, to put CD drives into computers actually led to it. That naturally wouldn't have happened had there not been an easy and simple way to get the music files onto the hard drives in the first place. So, so the story that's told has to be taken back a little bit and is much more about a technical innovation and an arbitrary decision made in the Technical Standards Committee for reasons that were perfectly defensible at the time that created the circumstances in which something much bigger could happen later down the line. <coughs> and that initial decision is the thing that's usually missed out. Because the story of Sean Fannin is so compelling and so entertaining, as we see in his um, sort of, um, fellow um, Napster creator, Sean Parker, has made it big in the social network film recently. That story is so easy to tell, and it's such a strong narrative that we tend not to look too far back to the real reasons why things might have been possible in the first place. And it's interesting to imagine what would have happened had the people who were specifying the CD standard been able to think about the possible impact and had done and had encrypted CDs in the first place, as indeed, of course, DVDs were, and then used the power of the law to um, enforce sanctions, even though the encryption they used wasn't that powerful. So the, the message really is that Toshiba killed the music industry, not, um, not, not Napster. But, but the point remains, in general, that whenever we looked at any of these stories, we found on the one hand, this uh, usually a compelling narrative, sometimes hilarious, as in the case of IBM, Bill Gates, Gary Kills, all of the rest of it, sometimes sad. But actually, when you look at it in detail, it doesn't stand up. And we figured, talking to this audience, there must be lots of cases where you know this, in your particular areas, you know the real story that happened, and you must, and you see it with frustration when you see it perverted by Whigs writing the history backwards. And also, the conservation of computers is also, as you all know, about telling, conserving the stories. It's about ensuring that those overlapping narratives are still available, that the historians who will eventually come and write about this time and about the last 40, 50 years, have enough to go on. And that the strangely compelling forward narrative that history is always moving forward, the history that has so far been written by the winners, should be at least available to be challenged. And those stories continue to be told. And they don't just take the nice, easy, shall we say, journalistic version, which Joy and I are sometimes guilty ourselves of propagating in our columns. So we'd like to hear what else there is that is generally believed to be true that is absolutely challenging. So you don't, don't just conserve the technology, you conserve the stories about this. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess that was an invitation for you to tell your story. <laughs> The classic is really the story of the commuter um, you know, being uh, developed at Gletchley Park and then being claimed to be American. Yeah. And that's arguable too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have 
come to young Tony stories. But, um, <laughs> I, I wanted to, um, it's not true, um, I wanted to um, just uh, observe something about your talk, which is that you tended to focus, not unreasonably, and it's, it's fascinating, on what might be called signal, signal points in history and decision points, um, perhaps technical ones, perhaps human ones. Um, but one of the big things for me in the 80s was the story that was going around, that everything that was going on in the home, this wonderful new microelectronics industry that we're all enjoying, at, both domestically and in my case in education, was formulated because of a, a military uh, background, a military drive, going back to before the war. And I wondered whether uh, that commentary, th those kinds of analyses, those kinds of viewpoints, do they have the same kind of... Uh, if you like, uh, ability to be debunked or looked at again, especially nowadays, uh, where commercialism seems to be so much stronger. Uh, in relation, for example, in relation to the Arpanet, that point's absolutely true, because the the, 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 the commercial narrative, the backward narrative by the Arpanet, is that it was um, designed to to implement Barron's resilient network in the face of the tools that would survive, uh, and the fact that it was funded by the Pentagon seem to confirm that. But the story is nothing like that, actually, partly because of what I've said about, about Barron's work being ignored. But the other thing is that Bob Taylor, whom I know, and who was the, who was the uh, relevant head of the ARPANET uh, department, which, fu which funded, which had the idea and funded the ARPANET, what was bugging Bob Taylor was nothing to do with nuclear war. It was to do with the fact that when he became the head of I the IPTO office in the Pentagon, he was on the f that fifth ring, that's very high prestige in the Pentagon. He had an office and he had an atrium. And in the atrium were three terminals attached to, I guess, acoustic couplers, which linked to, to, to three enormous mainframes that ARPA were um, funding. And uh, Robertson was, uh, he, uh, sorry, Bob Taylor was astonished to find that he had to master a whole set of arcane login commands and different syntax and the rest of it in order to log into these machines, all of which he was paying for. And he thought that was crazy. And he was right. So he said, let's do something about it. And he went to his boss, and his boss listened for 20 minutes and said, how much? And he said, a million dollars. And he said, you've got it. And Bob later said that he never knew from whose budget it had been taken. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the point is that it, the, the reasonable drive to build the ARPANET came not from all this stuff that we believe now about the Pentagon and, and surviving war and the rest of it. It was something much more human. Now, I don't know. I really don't know enough about, about, the, about, about the history to know about the relevant balance between um, military requirements and consumer developments. I just don't know. But, but in that particular instance, I do know. And it's a, it's a completely different story. That story is almost identical to the way Ben <coughs> Fritchie is supposed to have written Unix in order to avoid having to climb two flights of stairs to the RJE terminal, to the RJE terminal. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe that. That's why he needs commands are so short as well. Let's face it, we're all computer scientists, we're all fundamentally lazy and have within our hands the capabilities of real build tools that allow us to be lazy. And Unix was also a response to the, um, to the Kind of which is dislike of, of Multics multi operating system. I mean, it was partly aesthetic as well as laziness, I think. I, I want to interpret my own repost to you on Unix. When I first saw Unix, I said, because I wasn't much of a computer user at that stage, I had been and then become a manager. I said, I can't learn all this, I don't use it enough. But then something much more superior arrived, it was called the app language. <laughs> Point and click. Which of course is still running Unix, but anyway. <laughs> that's, underneath. that's underneath where it should be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's okay, it's, it's good stuff. But you should, it's not for human beings. <laughs> John, you've talked about the uh, history being written by the uh, winner. I've never quite understood the relationship of, of Whittle's jet engine developments and how the Germans seem to have been ahead in reality. But when I was brought up at school, Wickle was the only one that ever did anything in, the, in terms of it. But there must be a history further back, before the beginning of the war, that, where these guys were working all together rather than fighting each other. But do you know of any papers or anything that go right back to uh, pre-war on jet propulsion? Should have done to last week's RE so, so somebody knows, yeah? 
answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this 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 um, pressing note that what there will then be will be overlapping and contradictory stories from each side because the participants are separate and on the either side of the conflict. And it may well be, in fact, that there isn't a single story that can be told. And the best we can attempt is sort of, you know, is, is, a, is a history which tries to not to collapse the wave function, but that allows both of those stories to be true at the same time, and then looks at how they were joined together after. And I suspect that may be true in many cases. Some of the fact is. Yeah. There's a, an, an interesting corollary, perhaps, with the history of radio, because Marconi is the man who, you know, Marconi's radio. Um, there are people who say that, well, Marconi pinched the idea of a coherer from Chandra Bose, the Indian um, physicist. And there's also the story that in order to make the coherer work, he was actually given um, information by the Italian Navy, who decided they didn't need radio because they could wave to each other across the Adriatic and Mediterranean. Um, and again, the point comes out that his only possible customer is the British Admiralty. Yeah. Because the Americans at that point aren't into a Blue Sea Navy and so on. But I think the really interesting point about Marconi is that his mother was a Jameson of Jameson's whiskey. <laughs> and she knew about money and she knew about business. And that from that whole background became a successful product rather than a successful invention. As an Irishman, I'm delighted to hear that because that's the only ah. known, known example of, of, of Irish technological progress. Uh, <laughs> the point being, the Jameson family came from Scotland. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it does, yeah, yeah. Damn it. Uh, this is a question really not so much of the past but of the future. Both of you two guys are in the media, and there's a big battle raging at present as to how the conventional media makes money in the future with the impact of the web. Do you have any particular ideas on that? Well, do you like Mr. Murdoch? I, I, I do have some ideas. You go first. Um, well, actually, I've, I've done some research on this. Is the answer? And I think we're at that interesting point where the old ways of doing things are broken for lots of different reasons. And the new ways have not yet emerged, a true revolution. And where all that you have is some inventors of creativity. I actually think that the next few years is going to be quite bad for journalism. Not necessarily for the media. There will be entertainments to consume, and there will be blockbuster films to watch, and there will be small independent producers struggling. But, but for quality journalism, that the issue that faces serious journalism is that the problem that journalism developed to solve has to some extent gone away. That the flow of information, the way information moves around our knowledge economy is so very different from, from what it was 20 years ago that the bottlenecks that allow somebody to make a good income from tapping them and making information available have vanished. The, the ways the business models that sustain journalism have gone away, the advertising has moved, other things have vanished, and nobody yet really knows what can replace it. I think some forms of journalism will emerge, but we should see journalism as being something that comes out of serving the needs of a society, not something which is itself intrinsic to a society, and it's not clear what the information needs are going to be in five or ten years' time. So therefore not clear how you can do a business to satisfy those needs. Um, just to add to that, um, first thing is that you need to take a, a longer view. Um, one of the things that's very distressing at the moment to me is the fact that everybody wants answers tomorrow to questions that are really, very really difficult. The, the history of radio is interesting in this context and very instructive um, because broadcast radio appeared in the United States in, I think, the 1920s. And at that time, and for the next, for down, down nearly 20 years, nobody could figure out a business model for it. I mean, here you are, sending out these, these waves, and any sort of other receiver can hear it for free. How do you make money out of that? Well, hundreds of companies in the US were bust in that period, trying to figure out a business model for radio. And in the end, they, the solution was arrived at by a sole company, Procter & Gamble, which 
which we tell on that if you put up, if you sponsored compelling content and you associated your name with it, then that would be a serious business model for radio, and it was, and that's how we got the word, the, the term soap opera. So the first complaint I have about the present is that um, most people are seem incapable of taking any kind of intelligent long-term view of this. We're in the middle of a massive transformation in our communication environment, maybe analogous to 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 the one brought about by printing. And if you take that, just just to take that as an illustration, printing dates in Europe from 1455 when we know the first Gutenberg Bibles appeared. Okay. Now you imagine, and in in Mainz in Germany, you imagine 17 years from from on from 1455. You're a Maury pollster, and you're standing in your later hosen on the bridge in Mainz with a clip slate, doing a public opinion survey, and you're stopping people and saying, excuse me, can I ask you some questions? And here's question four. On a scale of one to five, where one is very likely and five is most unlikely, do you think that this invention of printing will, A, undermine the authority of the Catholic Church, B, part of the Reformation, C, enable the rise of modern science, D, change our conceptions of childhood, E, lead to the creation of whole new social classes? On a scale to one to five, it's a completely idiotic idea to ask that question. Well, we're 17 years into the web, and yet we're, we're claiming that we know where it's going. We have absolutely no <coughs> idea. And, and everybody in this business at the moment has, it, is behaving idiotically, in my opinion, because they're assuming that somehow there is an answer that can be found tomorrow. I'm sure, in the end, that business models will emerge, because they always have in the past, but to harness these kind of things. Um, but what it is, I, I don't. I don't know, and if I did know, I might be a good company. Um, the third thing is, um, uh, Stephen Berlin Johnson had a lovely metaphor for it, where he said, what's going on is a bit like Joseph Schumpeter's waves of creative destruction. Capitalism renews itself every 25 years, roughly speaking, with these colossal waves that sweep through it of innovation. And they destroy an awful lot of things in their path. Okay, so Stephen Johnson says, imagine it's like a, a terrible storm and, and a forest. You've got this, very, this forest of mature trees, and this storm tears through them, and, and it, 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 it not only decimates, I reduce by 10, but it kind of, it reduces by, by maybe 70% the trees that are there, okay? And then in a couple of years, in the clearings that result, there are saplings growing. And they're the new forest. But what's happening is that people like Rupert Murdoch are going around, stamping around the clearing, and they're saying, oh, that's just, yeah. Pulling the sapling up and saying, no, that doesn't work. And it's that lack of historical kind of perspective on this stuff that's really irritating for me, because I think it's so misguided. It's no consolation to the guys who use the jobs, of course, but there you go. <laughs> Interestingly enough, um, I'm currently, uh, I was at The Guardian in 1904 to 1906, and uh, I went on with Ian Mays, who's been um, contracted to write the official history of the newspaper for the 1900s. And so I had an interview with him um, about two weeks ago was thinking about this event and realised just how hard it was for me to get a coherent story of what I really did in yeah. 15, 20 years ago. Uh, even though I actually found some around manos and papers and things like that. <coughs> and the question he was asking was clear that the other people we talked to had entirely in, uh, inconsistent views of what we all did. And this was a relatively recent history. And so you know, I pitied him and tried to put together a coherent narrative. And of course, for every writer was involved, I think it's um, significant to remark that all predictions about the future computing have been wrong and will continue to be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and it, that's the fun of it. It surprises us. Even Turing was wrong about artificial intelligence. <laughs> Very wrong. Any more? Yeah, I think there's um, one point I'd like to pick up on perhaps the naturalistic metaphor that we were using uh, a minute ago about uh, forests and growth and so on. Uh, the relationship, obviously, you know, between what you might call biological evolution and this kind of evolution that we're involved in in computer science, particularly. And Brian Arthur at the Santa Fe Institute has coined a term combinatorial evolution to try and help explain why it is that there's very rapid developments by pulling in things from other people. The knowledge economy, of course, is, is, based, is, is just primed to support this idea of combinatorial uh, evolution, ever more uh, highly developed technologies uh, emerging from that. So I'm sure underlying the narratives that you've been talking about, there is this process of technological contact, 
know, I don't know who the mathematician was and said that mathematical ability uh, travels from father to son-in-law and definitely, you know, is, is not a pure biological, <coughs> excuse me, a biological process. But <coughs> certainly a very simple um, example from, uh, from my own experience was that in the uh, late 50s and early 60s, I was working in the mathematical services department at Farnborough. Uh, my particular interest, and I was a very junior member of the team there, and just beginning to understand about computing, was developing uh, simulation models for looking at queuing theory for air traffic control uh, models, packets going across the Atlantic at very slow speed, but with metadata requirements and so on. And there was very great communication between Farnborough and NPL at that time on, on that kind of mathematics, out of which eventually I feel as to junior to know much about it, <coughs> I'm sure it would have influenced some of the developments uh, that Donald Davis was involved in. So it is this process of, of knowledge in the scientific community, bringing things together, uh, and a rapidly accelerating evolution. Uh, and I think that's what's happening today. Of course, you can't uh, predict what's going to happen unless you happen to have a 300-page now non-disclosure agreement <laughs> that you need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, sorry, you mentioned at the beginning your weekly read of the Observer and John Norton's column. I too uh, indulge in that uh, Sunday activity. And uh, about three weeks back, they had an editorial saying how we we're going to lose everything because everything was done by email. And to which I replied in a letter that they actually printed saying the secret is to keep the emails. And that way we shall have the history. And I just put a plea to all of you, keep your emails. The snag is, of course, doing so may be slightly illegal if they contain, contain personal data about living people. And I actually think that's a silly law as well. Thank you. But, but you don't have to worry about it because the government's keeping it for you anyway. <laughs> new development. Well, I found the need for one coming up in the train to London this morning. <laughs> in all the seats around me, apart from the children, but including some of the children, were people looking at a little screen like that and pressing things. I had a paper, a newspaper, which was delivered to my door this morning. <laughs> Lovely thing. I could fold it, I could throw it away, I could do anything with it. Can you please develop something which is as good as a newspaper to handle for getting news? Surely the iPad's going in that direction. Yeah. I, I think it's a direct retinal input actually. <laughs> 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 I'm scrolling along in my visual field because it's, I've got a little port plugged into my um, visual um, I, I, would like, I would like something that would read things intelligently and give me a summary of them, because I'm a physicist. It's called a summary. It used to be an alternative Turing test, which was it could only be designed in a piece of software that would, would create intelligent excuses. <laughs> <coughs> Just about to remark, hasn't the independent done that uh, yes. with this little four-sheet junk that they produced <laughs> this week? Because they've created um, something which is impossible to find online. Mm. You cannot Google the letter R. Yeah. And if you Google ah. R, 
paper, you don't find that they've completely misunderstood how that data is getting into or how to get where it is. That's lovely. <laughs> Well, I'd like to finish with my story, the perceived wisdom of the real story, if I may. John gave some majority remarks about my, my role as mayor of mainframe services in a tyrannical fashion. In a tyrannical, and you were too, yes. In a tyrannical fashion, you had to go on your knees and beg for it. The real story is, at the same time, I was busy wiring up Cambridge, from which you now benefit. <laughs> John and Bill, thank you very, very much for an entertaining afternoon. Uh, it's been different, I said it would be different. And it's been great fun as well. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Two administrative announcements before we run away. Uh, one is the next meeting is on the what time of November? 18th. 18th November, when we have the son of Zuza, Horse Zuza, come and talk about, I think, the work of his father, I presume. The other administrative announcement is, and I, I'm surprised that um, Simon Langton hasn't pointed this out, that my chairman's report to the AGM has a terrible error in the bottom. <laughs> 2012 is not the anniversary of Turing's death, or his birth. I apologize to Alan Turing and to Simon. Thank you very much, everyone.